Hello, my name is Emmanuel Papadogiannakis. Today I have the pleasure of talking about user tracking in the post-cookie era, and specifically how websites bypass GDPR consent in order to track users. This work is a result of a collaboration between the University of Crete, Ford and Telefonica Research, and was partially supported by the EU Horizon 2020 program, and specifically the projects Concordia, CyberSec for Europe, Team City and Accordion. First, I'm going to talk about the motivation behind our work. Then, I will talk about some prevalent tracking mechanisms and the methodology that we use to study them. And finally, I will talk about our results and findings, as well as some closing remarks. So, we can start with the motivation behind our work. Nowadays, the online advertising ecosystem relies heavily on tracking users and collecting their data. Ultimately, the advertising networks want to track users in order to learn the profile generated by their actions. This sometimes aggressive tracking and data collection has led to legislation that focuses on information privacy and data protection. A good example of such legislation is the General Data Protection Regulation, or GDPR, which aims to give individuals located in the European Union control over their personal data. In the past few years, we have seen that this does not stop in European countries. There is similar legislation all around the world, such as the California Consumer Privacy Act. In order for companies to collect and process personal data lawfully, they need to get the user's consent. As a result, websites now use cookie banners in order to collect consent. These banners are simple web forms where users can state their preferences regarding data processing or even the third parties that will have access to their personal data. Sometimes, users are given the option to accept all cookies and data processing purposes, to accept only some of them, or even reject them all. There has been a lot of work that focuses on whether these consent forms actually respect users' choices when it comes to cookies, and whether they store a different consent than the one provided by the user. In this work, we explore a different perspective of these consent forms. Specifically, we set out to discover what happens when the user does not interact with these banners or when the user denies consent. Do websites use other forms of tracking besides cookies in these cases? And if so, which forms of tracking are used and to what extent? Now, before moving on, I'm going to talk about some tracking mechanisms that we studied. One form of tracking is ID sharing, which can be further split into two types. Here is the first type, called first-party ID leaking. We can see that when a user visits a website, an alias or identifier is assigned to the user by the first party. With ID leaking, this alias is leaked from the website that the user visited to other third parties. This way, third parties can learn about the actions and behavior of the user in this specific website. Another type of ID sharing is third-party ID synchronization. This starts when the user visits two unrelated websites. Let's assume that both websites include third parties that want to track the user across the web. We can see that both third parties set a unique identifier for the user, usually in the form of a cookie. Tracker.com knows the user as user123, while ad.com knows the same user as user ABC. Now, let's assume that the user visits a third website that includes a script from tracker.com. This script will issue an HTTP GET request for tracker.com, and the browser will automatically attach the respective cookie. Next, tracker.com will respond with a redirect request. This request will be towards ad.com, but with the URL 
that contains very important information. You can see that the request contains the ID that tracker.com has assigned to the user, as well as the website that the user visited. This means that ad.com now knows two things. First, that user ABC visited the third website, even though ad.com has nothing to do with it. And most importantly, it knows that the user that tracker.com knows as user123 is the same as user ABC. The two third parties collaborated and managed to join the different identifiers that have been assigned to the same user. Of course, there can be server-to-server -server communication in order for both parties to merge their identifiers and collect the data. Finally, another form of tracking is browser fingerprinting. This tracking mechanism is basically a script which collects information about the device and its settings. Such information includes the browser application and its version, the screen resolution, the operating system, and so on. Then, the script combines this information in order to create a fingerprint for this device. The more information is collected, the more bits of entropy are provided, and this allows to almost uniquely identify users across the web. Now, let us see how we are able to study the effect of the different options users are provided with when they visit a website that contains a cookie consent form. We built a puppeteer-based web crawler which instruments instances of the Chromium browser. This crawler is able to visit websites and collect important data such as network traffic and stored cookies. We also utilize the Consentomatic tool, which is able to automatically detect and handle consent forms of popular consent management platforms. We used this crawler in order to visit the top 850,000 most popular websites ranked by the Tranco list. When the Consentomatic extension detected a cookie consent form, we visited the website three times. In the accept all case, the extension was configured to grant consent for all data processing purposes and third parties. In the reject all case, the extension denied consent for all processing purposes and cookies. And finally, in the no action case, there was no interaction at all with the cookie banner. The extension managed to detect a cookie banner in approximately 27,000 websites. In order to detect ID sharing, we extract values stored in either first-party or third-party cookies. We perform values pre-processing and data cleaning techniques in order to filter out irrelevant values and ensure that what we are left with are values that can uniquely identify users. Then, we examine all application-level network traffic and search for these identifiers. We report a case of ID sharing only when the identifier is delivered to a domain different from the one that assigned the cookie originally. Regarding browser fingerprinting, we analyze the code of one of the most popular fingerprinting libraries, specifically Fingerprint.js. We identified some JavaScript functions defined by this library that indicate clear intent to fingerprint the user's device. When we visited a website, we enabled the browser's built-in JavaScript profiler and stored call frames and function names. This way, we were able to detect these fingerprinting functions and even identify the exact scripts that perform browsing fingerprinting. Finally, we can now see the results and findings of our study. Let us examine an example timeline of a user visiting a website. The user decides to visit the website and the website will start loading. At some point in time, the user will be presented with a consent form. The user will have to make a decision regarding their data and then state their preference in the consent form. Let's assume that the user chose to accept all data processing purposes and third-party vendors. As a result, the user will be tracked. 
since third parties have the permission to collect and process data. This is what the users expect to happen when they visit a website and interact with a cookie consent form. This is what should happen. However, we found that tracking begins even before the user has any chance to state their preference. About half of the websites with a detected cookie consent form perform first-party ID leaking before the user has any opportunity to interact with the consent form. So, even though one might expect that there is no tracking when there is no action by the user, this is not the case. Evidently, third parties track users without their consent and even before the users have any chance to grant consent. The same applies to third-party ID synchronization. There, we found that on average, a third-party identifier is synchronized with over three other third parties, even if the user does not interact with the consent form at all. To make matters worse, we also found that when the user denies consent, tracking becomes more aggressive. In this case, more websites leak in identifiers, and these identifiers are leaked to even more third parties. This means that websites leak more information when users choose to reject all cookies than to take no action at all. It is clear that in such cases, the user's preferences are completely ignored. We also examine websites that perform browser fingerprinting. Specifically, we found that most websites do not take users' consent into account when it comes to fingerprinting. They perform it no matter what the consent is. Specifically, we found that 73% of the websites ignore users' consent and perform browser fingerprinting in all three types of visits. There are very few websites that perform browser fingerprinting only when the user has given consent. Surprisingly, we also found a small number of websites that perform browser fingerprinting only when the user denies consent. Obviously, these websites believe that consent does not apply to browser fingerprinting, and since they are not allowed to set cookies, they use this technique as a fallback tracking mechanism. We also performed some experiments in order to explore if there is a correlation between a website's popularity and the extent of the tracking. As expected, we found that websites which are less popular, meaning that they are ranked lower in the Tranco list, are more likely to disregard users' consent and perform more ID sharing operations. Finally, we studied the country top-level domains of websites with consent forms. Our results show that websites with a European top-level domain are more likely to respect users' choices than non-European-based websites. In non-European-based websites, we found that when it comes to ID sharing, there is little difference whether the user chooses to accept all cookies or to reject them all. Such examples are Canadian or Australian websites. So, to recap. During the last few years, we have seen that there is legislation that obliges websites to ask for consent before they collect and process user data. In this work, we studied some more sophisticated tracking mechanisms and whether websites use these techniques when users stated that they don't want any cookies. Such forms of tracking include first-party ID leaking, third-party ID synchronization, and browser fingerprinting. Based on our experiments, we found that websites track users even before they have any chance to state their preference, and that this tracking is even more aggressive when the users deny consent. The takeaway of this work, the one thing to remember, is that there is a very big gap between what the users expect to happen when they see and interact with a consent form in a website, and what the majority of the websites actually do. Thank you very much.